Sure has been great to see all of you today. A lot of you wondered this morning what in the world I was doing here. Maybe nothing more uh, curious than a preacher out of place, but uh, back the last time we came, David uh, and Liska had me over, and David told me a little bit about some of the fishing that he does. I love to hunt and fish, and always looking for a new experience in connection with those, and uh, I've been on a kayak before, but never with a fishing rod. So uh, when it came Thursday, and David took me fishing Friday and Saturday, the reason I don't sell, smell fishy today is because we didn't catch much fish. But the water was real muddy from the weather that you guys have been having, so uh, fish couldn't see our, our bright, luminous lure that we had. And we should have had some crawfish. We found that out the day yesterday that they were biting that like crazy but uh, in any case we did bring some uh, catch enough I could take some back with me and girls were worried about having freezer space if I brought a lot so maybe the Lord had a better solution than mine and so but it's been, it's been great visiting with David and his family uh, we came at a maybe a less than uh, the best time for him although I got to uh, meet and see a lot of his kids and grandkids and things like that. Uh, but we're keeping his family in our prayers and their loss. My wife sends her greetings, and so do the brethren from uh, the River City Church in Columbus, Georgia, where I work. And this congregation, of course, helps in my support. Uh, things are going well, continuing to go well. We've had about <clears throat> nine additions to the group uh, in the la- since I saw you last. Now, we've... Uh, temporarily lost a family of six. Uh, he's been deployed to Afghanistan and his wife and four kids have gone to live with his parents while he's over there just to have the family support that the grandparents can lend. So, uh, But um, the ones that have come into our fold uh, from churches that are really not practicing New Testament Christianity, they may have a, you know, a biblical name on the sign, uh, they have been searching and unhappy where they were at and saying, why are we doing this? Where's the Bible authority for this? Uh, they found us through the commercials that we've been running on the local ABC affiliate, and incidentally, we've moved to the NBC affiliate now and kind of get a different batch of watchers and listeners. We've had another station, too, that uh, it's a small, independent religious station that's airing all our commercials free right now. So, But... Pray that uh, the, the commercials that we're running now will bring in as many visitors as the ones that were ran on ABC. Uh, they brought in a lot of visitors, uh, easily five a week for a long stretch of time. And I would ask them, you know, what, you know did you see us, you know, what, what brought you to us? And they would say, well, we saw the t- commercial television. And certainly, I will say this much about TV commercials. They don't always give you the best prospects because they don't have a connection. The best prospects are your friends and your, your loved ones. That's the best prospects. And the TV, but, but when you have a small group of 25 people, we don't have a lot of friends and, and relatives to work with, a uh, limited number, and so uh, we opted for something like that and, uh, have, and, and are running those commercials this year on the NBC. If I pray that that has a, a good result too. And uh, the, the ones that have uh, come from these churches that are not uh, really uh, preaching and teaching what they ought to be preaching and teaching, uh, say that there's still a good number of of other people in those churches that have expressed concern and continue to talk to them. So uh, I think the field is fertile and we're uh, just waiting, looking for opportunities, still having our community studies. And I appreciate your prayers and want to encourage you to continue to, uh, if you get a chance to come our way, come visit us. And uh, we would love that. Uh, when you're small, you appreciate every person, every voice, every encouragement. And uh, that would be a good deed if you're over in that direction to take a small detour and come see us. We appreciate that. Okay. I'm going to talk tonight about cultivating a heart of thankfulness. And I know here, and it's already on. Okay. Cultivating a heart of thankfulness. Um, I like to garden. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 13, verse 8, 
Some of the seed in the parable of the sower fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Good ground can be worked with. You can do something with good ground. You can improve it. Uh, when you cultivate it, air and sunshine gets into the ground. And the rainwater can soak in better and more evenly. Uh, you, leaves and other natural fertilizers can be tilled in. Good ground can be made better. I want to ask you tonight, are you good ground? Can you be made better? Can, can we cultivate a little bit? Talk about how to make you and me a little bit more thankful even than we are now. So we plow some furrows a little bit, and if you're good ground, then we'll cultivate this better heart of thankfulness. All of us probably know that we should be maybe a little more thankful than we generally tend to be. Too often our thankfulness reflects our physical situation and the people we're around. We kind of play off of them. If they're complaining, we kind of complain a little bit. People like to complain. We like to feel like that the place that we're at is because of certain disadvantages we have. And we would be in a better place, better person, have accomplished more if we just didn't have so many disadvantages and so many difficulties. We live in a society of plenty and quite frankly, we're not very thankful as a people, as a culture. That's certainly true. And there are times of the year when we think about it a little at Thanksgiving and around the Christmas time. Remember several years ago, I lived in Mobile, Alabama and... I don't know how they made this judgment, but they judged Mobile one of the top ten most courteous cities in America. And of course, that, the city founders plastered that all over. And you heard commercials about it all on the radio. And for about two weeks, everywhere you went, oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, let me open the door for you. Let me help you with that. And people were pushing you in line. You know, if you were waiting to get in line, oh, you go ahead and take that lane. It's okay. That lasted about two weeks. And then after that, people were back to their, their old yelling self at, at each other. Uh, that's the way things happen sometimes. Something might happen to make me a little bit thankful, but if it's some circumstance, then it doesn't last very long. Or if it's somebody who tells me, you know, well, you're not a very thankful person. And that might disturb me a little bit because I consider myself a thankful person. I say thank you a lot. And I think about that, and I want to prove them wrong, and so I'm going to make myself say thank you more and prove that I'm a thankful person. That's not going to last very long because you're doing it for reasons other than you should. There's some solid biblical reasons that will compel us and propel us to be more thankful and it to be a permanent change in our lives, as it should be. That's what I want to talk about. So first of all, you think about the fact that thankfulness, basically, if you take it backwards, means the quality of being filled with thanks, okay? So we talk about thankfulness. You want to be filled with it. it will, it's your quality. It's the thing that people think about when they think about you. And when you find somebody who's a thankful person, they'll make a great friend. They'll make a great uh, companion in life. And you're choosing a mate for life. Be sure you pick somebody who knows and has the capacity, knows how and has the capacity to be thankful. So first of all, I want to suggest to you that what we need to do to be more thankful is to make ourselves, first of all, content in life. Paul said in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 11, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now notice, Paul made a decision. What did Paul decide to do? Did Paul decide, well, I've had it so good, I probably ought to be thankful. No, He's, no he said, I've decided whatever state I am, to be, you notice he said, in all things, everywhere and in all things, I've learned both to be full and to be hungry. How can you be full and be hungry at the same time? You can always recognize that it could be worse. And you can always recognize that I can make myself a better. So at the same time, you can recognize your need to grow and your need to appreciate what you have now. That's so powerful. 
What can Satan do to you when you're content? What can he dangle in front of you? Some shiny object, something you wanted when you were a kid? Won't work anymore. You're content. You're okay. You don't need it. You don't really recognize that you want it as much as you thought you did. Being content. Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, Godliness with contentment is great gain. You can accomplish something very significant in your life when you combine godliness, that is a spiritual understanding of how you need to live your life with contentment. Very powerful. It begins with a simple realization and a candid admission of the truth. I've been blessed. I have more than enough. We don't deserve the blessings that we've received. Consider life in many other places. There are so many nations that are filled with people who view America as that's where I want to live and who risk their lives on the slimmest possibility that they might live here. True contentment allows us to be thankful not just in time but permanent. It's a permanent change. A person who is not content with what he has or she has, cannot, ne- cannot ever be uh, truly thankful. And sadly, and all too often, we don't really appreciate what we have until we lose it. Well, I'm not content if I don't appreciate something until I lose it. And then, of course, I'm, I'm unhappy because I lost it. So I compound the problem. So if I start from a, a position of contentment and I lose something... Well, my compass is still pointing north. It's still pointing toward God. It's still, my attitude, my disposition is still what it ought to be. You know, if the road to salvation includes thankfulness, and I believe it does, then we've got to make a decision to be content. And can you, can you say with me, can you recognize, as, as I hope I do, that I've been blessed in my life by God, and if God chose to shut off the spigot right now, and I never got another blessing in my life, I would have to say I've been a blessed man. That's the attitude that we need to have. But along with being content, we have to not worry. Worry destroys happiness. It destroys thankfulness. Of course, concern for most things is proper. But when it becomes an obsession... And we're no longer able to function as God intends us to function, as a father or mother or as parents or members of the church or at my job. I'm obsessed about something that I can no longer function, then it becomes sinful and wrong. We can't be thankful in that circumstance. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24 and 25, You cannot serve God and mammon, therefore... Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will put on. Jesus recognizes a problem that too many of us have. We're trying to divide our allegiance, our devotion, partly to ourselves and to things of this world and partly to God. Actually, the word worry means, it's, an old, it's a Greek word that means to divide your mind. You know, sometimes as a mother, you feel like you need eight hands. And women can probably manage that a lot better than us guys could do, but you still can't divide your mind like that and function successfully. Consider Jesus is talking about food and clothes. What types of things do we most often worry about? Be honest. Is it food and clothes? No. No, your cupboard's full. Your refrigerator's full. Your closet's full. We decide that we, not, not that we want food, but I want the food I want and I want it now. That's what we worry about. And, and we want what we want to wear and we want it now. Even though our old clothes are not worn out. They're just a little bit out of fashion, at least it's what Hollywood tells us. We're among the wealthiest people in the world, but we probably worry as much as any people in the world. You think about that. I visited Mozambique several times, several years ago made four trips, and um, it is amazing. Those people sleep on the dirt on a bamboo mat, and they get up in the morning, and they have to decide, well, I've got what... It's not like, what do I want to eat today? It's like, what can I obtain? What can I go out and scramble and get? And when we have 
brethren over for a gospel meeting and they come and spend all day, we have to feed them. We do this out of the, the, the money that comes from individuals, but we have to feed them because we can't just send them home. They've lost, for instance, they've been with us all morning. They would have spent time getting food then. Now they don't have anything to eat. Brethren would still come and do without. But we need to have that attitude and recognize how blessed we are with the things that we have. And of course, we need to recognize if we decide to be content, we need to make up our minds that we're going to leave everything in God's hands. If I'm going to be content, then I've got to let God run my life. That's what it means. You, Paul said in, when, when you're baptized into Christ, you put to death the old man. Who is that? Well, in my case, it's me. In your case, it's you. You put to death your old man. Well, what does that mean? Well, Paul said in Galatians chapter 2, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. You put yourself to death, you put Christ on the throne of your heart, and God runs your life now. That's what being devoted to God means. It has to be that way because if I run my life, I know what the result is. The result is sin and shame and regret. If God rules my life, if He truly rules my life, I know I'm a better person. And so we have to make that decision. If it's best for me and God grants my prayer, good. If it's not best for me and I don't get what I want, that's okay. I'm the better for it. Either way, we're going to be content and we're not going to worry. Those things are necessary for you to be thankful and also for you to be happy as well. Well, it's come time that we just need to give thanks. We need to say thank you. I want everybody to say thank you together with me right now. Thank you. Now you proved you can say it. Okay? You've been around people who receive all kinds of service from other people and never, ever say thank you. A husband whose wife waits on him hand and foot and he doesn't say thank you for anything. Maybe he does behind closed doors, but he never does that I can hear. Or a wife who sees her husband go off to work and take care of things around the house as a husband ought to and to, to, to be ready to protect her in in any number of circumstances that may arise, and she never says thank you. Some couples just have this unwritten agreement that they're not going to say thank you to one another. It needs to start somewhere. We're often blustered by someone that we help out in some way, and they just kind of walk out after receiving our blessing and not say anything. We say, the least you can do is say thank you. And that's true. That is the least you could do. It doesn't cost anything. It takes a moment of your time. It only takes a few seconds and the proper humility. That's what it takes. The proper humility. Perhaps therein lies the root of the problem. Great thankfulness comes from humility. First of all, we need to be humble enough and ready to thank God. For all the things that we've had in life, Philippians chapter 4 verse 6, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ Jesus. So see, if you trust in God, and you let your prayers go up to God, their prayers of thankfulness and supplication, then... The peace of God is going, to, is going to guard your heart. You think about what he's saying here. First of all, we've been talking about contentment and not worrying. Now we're talking about peace in your heart. And that peace will guard your heart. I like it when I go into a place where there's security. Not a big deal, but there's somebody there that might stand between me and the bullet. <laughs> It's nice to know when sometimes you go to worship and there, there, you know there are people there who would protect you if someone were to come and try to attack the congregation. It's nice to know that the peace of God can guard my heart, can protect me, can ensure that I'm okay. 
And so we need to let our requests be made known to God. We need to thank God for the blessings we have. We need to say thank you to God. Take the time to do that. Every time you, you count your blessings and thank your, 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 you thank your maker, your provider, your sustainer, and he hears that prayer. What do you think God is going to do if I'm thankful for what I have? He's very likely to make sure I have everything I need. He may give me more of what I'm thankful for. I know with my children that's the case. That the ones that, that thank you for what you have, you have the desire, well, I just, that, that, well I'm glad. Thank you for being thankful. And you give them something. <laughs> It's, it's a natural response, and I'm not saying God will always do that. God is going to do what's best for us, and maybe I do have enough. That's okay. But I'll tell you what, he's glad that I've got a thankful heart. We also need to thank others. We need to say thank you. The problem with most of us is that we think we're thank thankful, but we actually don't say we're thankful. Well, she knows I'm thankful. Like the old joke about the guy who said, told her I loved her when I married her, and I'll tell her if I changed my mind. She knows that I'm thankful. I, I know some people that they don't say something like that, and then when you, 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 you get the, the, the gumption to call them on it because it's just, it, maybe it's becoming a, a problem in their relationship, and you, you see that, just you call them on it, and then they just break down in tears. Sometimes we know we ought to be saying it. We don't. I'm, I'm not sure why. There may be a different reasons why we don't. We know we ought to be saying it, and we, we have this kind of standoff, this Mexican standoff, and she won't say it, and he won't say it, and somebody needs to be the first one to say it. Well, if I start saying it, then he'll think he's getting the upper hand, or she'll think she's running the show. It can't be about that. You do not need to worry about your relationship with anybody on this earth as much as you need to worry about your relationship with God. Do it for the Lord. Did the Lord have a thankful heart? Absolutely. He prayed to God continually. What did He say on the cross? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. The, the attitude of Jesus was more than magnanimous. He obviously took the first step in this process. When I was an enemy, He died for me. Jesus went to the cross with joy in his heart, Hebrews 12. So I need, to say thankful, I need to say thank you to others because of what God has done for me, because of my thanks, thankfulness to him. You know, in basketball, good shooters aim for the back of the rim. You know why that is? Because humans tend to fall short of the mark. So if when you're shooting the basketball, here's a trick. If you look at the back of the rim, then you'll tend to make your shot more often, especially than when you're looking at the front of the rim. Human beings tend to fall short of the mark. And I'll guarantee you, if, if you feel like you're a thankful person and you say it some, chances are maybe you need to say it a little bit more than you do. When we begin to say it, we affect not only those who hear it, we begin to affect ourselves. Because when I'm living a life that is a little bit of a lie, I know I should be saying it, I know I should be expressing it more than I do, but I'm not. But then I change and I begin expressing it like I ought to, like I should have all along. It'll begin to change me. I'll be able to, to be comfortable, more comfortable in my relationship with others because I'm saying something that they need to hear. I'm being an example to my children or my grandchildren in what I say and how I conduct myself. And finally, we need to put our, atti our, a uh, uh, our attitude into actions, our desire to be thankful into actions. We feel it, but we need to show it as well as feel it and say it. 1 Timothy chapter 6 Paul says, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good that they may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. What did God say about rich people? Well, they should give a bunch of money to the church? Is that what they should do? Well, all of us should give generously and not sparingly. That's no, you know... 
give bountifully and not sparingly. The Bible teaches that. But God's not really interested in a rich man's money any more than he is in a poor man. God doesn't need money. You need to be rich in good works. Did he say to the rich people, pay somebody to do good works? No, he didn't do that either. He said, you go out there and you do good works. Be rich in good works. That's what you need to. You know, the truth of the matter is, all of us are rich. When I went to Vietnam several years ago, a bunch of years ago, about the year 2000, and worked with a church over there for about a month, but uh, the brethren had told me that they thought of America, and they called America the promised land. And whenever something bad happened in America, they were very afraid because God has blessed America, and if God for some reason is angry with America, how angry he must be with the people in Vietnam. Kind of sad, isn't it? I knew a very different America that they were talking about. Well, God has blessed America, no doubt, and it may seem like the land of promise to some people. I know there's a lot of sin and iniquity, a lot of attitudes that are ungodly in our culture. We need to recognize our need to be rich in good works. As a rule, we belittle our prosperity as if it's not a big thing. I know that we should not live for good works, but what God has done for our nation, particularly in terms of freedoms and the things that we enjoy in that, in that, that uh, genre, those things are very, very special. Our forefathers, as a rule, eked out a living from sun up to sundown. And in the process, many of them made a good Christian life for themselves. They made time to raise their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. They made time to worship God every time the doors are open. They listened to long, hard sermons and amen them heartily, sitting on hard benches in mosquito-filled, non-air-conditioned rooms. They even made time to tell their neighbors about the Lord. And the church grew so much it made the cover of Time magazine. Today, while our children rule the family, we sit in air-conditioned comfort complaining that we don't have time to do God's will. And I'm not just talking about going to church. I'm talking about serving your neighbors. I'm talking about inviting folks to come to worship or to a, to a, a, a gospel meeting, uh, inviting them to have a Bible study or encouraging them in any number of ways that you could do. These are things that should be the center of your life. If you did that, then you would learn in time that you were becoming and would become a thankful person, putting these things into action. It says when Abraham offered Isaac on Mount Moriah, this is in James chapter 2, it says that his faith was working with his works, and his, by his works, his faith was made complete. Think about that. Your works change your faith. You know, he said the demons believe and tremble. Of course, they do not do godly works. But the Christian can and should and must. It's one thing to sit back and say, God, I'm thankful. God, I believe in you. God, I believe in your church, and I, I believe in the process to uh, obey the gospel, become a Christian, and I believe that people that come to you will be saved. But if you don't go out and do all those things, the works that are connected to all those doctrines and, and truths, you've utterly failed as a child of God and as a disciple of Jesus. Let's start showing our thankfulness by doing God's will. And if we do that, then we'll become thankful people. So consider how deciding you will be content determining not to worry, expressing your thankfulness to others, and doing God's will in your life. How much that will make you a happier person. Most all of us have known of couples in which one may be a Christian and one not. I heard stories of women that married men who were not Christians and those men having promised them before they were married that they never would interfere with their efforts to come to worship did the very thing that they promised they would never do after they got married. I knew no men that would go out and uh, disconnect the, uh, the, the, the spark plugs from the, uh, the car so that it wouldn't start, or maybe just take off with the car, the only 
vehicle in the family right before services. And the wife, I knew one uh, woman who that happened to, and she, according to the story, she got her kids. They were all dressed for worship. And she came to get in the car, and it was gone. He had just left. And she grabbed the hands of her two kids and started walking toward the church building. And she lived so far she'd never make it there. And she got back, you know, I guess at the point of time when she, the services were over, she turned around and came home. And it so moved him what he had done because of what she had done that he never did that again. Can you imagine someone so ungrateful that they would hinder another person wanting to go to worship? Not appreciating the fact that what she learned and how she was motivated as she went to worship was the reason she was a good wife, a good mother to his children. He did later obey the gospel and become a Christian. That's very powerful. You never know what expressing your thankfulness and showing your thankfulness will do to another person. And it becomes so much easier. We we often say, my wife and I, that, that when marriage is good, it is so good, you can't imagine why people have it any other way. Now, I know it it takes two people to make a marriage right, and you can't do it all by yourself, but it is a tragedy sometimes when a good marriage is lost because people are unwell. One or more of the members in that marriage are unwilling to be humble, to be uh, thankful to one another, to try to do things for one another as they vowed they would do when they got married. And, you know, they say a mind is a terrible thing to waste. Well, what about a soul? God wants us to be thankful people. Our salvation depends upon that. So I want you to make this goal for yourself this week. I'm going to be more thankful. When, I, when somebody cuts me off in traffic, when somebody says something that they shouldn't say, when someone uh, talks behind my back or does something that, uh, that, 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 that they shouldn't do, I'm not going to let myself be angry because of that. I'm not going to get on my high horse And how dare you ever think about doing this or that? I'm going to be thankful that I'm a Christian. I'm going to be thankful that Jesus is my Savior. And I'm going to rise above it. Now I know that there are times when you need to, there's some justice and there's some things and circumstances that you need to be in. But just make your mind up that, and and pray. And here's a good one. You need to pray to God tonight to give you the wisdom to be more thankful this week. Having come to the end of your week, I hope that you find that that's the kind of person you want to be always for the rest of your life. I know God will help you and encourage you if you will. And certainly we as brethren want to encourage you too. We want to sing a song of invitation in a moment. Get out your songbooks and open it to the songs that's been chosen. I appreciate so very much your kind attention. And hopefully these things are, are things that will encourage you to be more thankful in your life and help you to be more content and to worry less, and to be happier in life. We begin every week with a new week. We begin every day with a new day. And we can be the kind of person we need to be, must be. We've got to make some decisions. Like Paul said, such a powerful statement, I have determined in all circumstances to be content. And I hope that you uh, will make the steps that are necessary to bring your life in harmony with God's will tonight. If you're not a Christian, to obey the gospel and baptism. If you are a Christian if, and you're not living as God has commanded, you know that you're not in a right relationship with Him, change that. Turn things around. Make the difference tonight. And God will bless you and give you strength. And you'll be a better person and a different person, stronger person, an eternal person as God takes you through this journey and through this process. We can help you in any way to do those things, and we encourage you to come while we stand and sing.